Welcome to the session on scaling up psychosocial therapies. Uh, my name is Neil Lesh, and I am going to moderate the session. Uh, John, you can go to the next slide, uh, and I'm going to start by introducing all the panelists, um, and I'll read their bios and then uh, hand it off to John uh, for the first presentation. Um, and first, let me give regrets of Vikram Patel and Daisy Signala, who were originally going to be on this panel, but due to travel, uh, uh, travel they had, they weren't able to, to join. Um, the first panelist will be John Nasland. He's an instructor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. He holds expertise in psychiatric epidemiology, implementation science, and digital mental health. Dr. Nasland's work is focused in low resource settings with emphasis in India and the United States and covers the following three major thematic areas. First, uh, training and building capacity of non-specialist health workers. Second, health promotion and addressing excess mortality in persons living with severe mental disorders, and third, digital platforms for peer-to-peer -peer support, challenging stigma, and empowering individuals living with mental illness and their families. Dr. Nasland has a long-standing track record advocating for the rights, dignity, and quality of healthcare for those living with mental illness. Uh, we're also lucky to have Anushka Patel, a clinical psychologist specializing in trauma-related assessment and treatment across cultures. Anushka is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard based in uh, Dr. Vikram Patel's and John Naslund's lab. She focuses on scalable treatment development for people in underserved communities. Anushka is also a content developer, co-lead, content development co-lead on the Empower Project, and she has helped create more than 70 videos and supporting educational content for two Empower courses. Um, our esteemed uh, panelists also include Natalie Carmillo. She is a clinical psychologist from Buenos Aires, Argentina. She completed her MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health, where she focused on race, gender, disparities in healthcare policy interventions that can mitigate uh, health inequity. She has also conducted research related to trauma and Latinx migration and IT systems and mental health. She is currently Empower's program manager at the Mental Health for All Lab at Harvard Medical School. And I'm the fourth panelist, Neil Lesh. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer of Damagi. Uh, I received a PhD in Computer Science at the University of Washington and a Master's in Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. As Chief Strategy Officer of Damagi, my role includes developing new innovation areas uh, for Damagi. And recently, I've been leading an initiative within Damagi to expand our efforts to provide digital support for mental health care globally. Um, so one thing before I hand it over to John, we're going to allow a little bit of Q&A um, within each talk. So John will present uh, while he's talking, you can add your questions or afterwards, when he, if there's a few minutes at the end of his talk, we'll have uh, time for just a few questions. We'll do that for each talk. And then at the end, we'll have more time for open, open Q&A. So please think of your questions and um, feel free to type them into the chat window. Over to you, John. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Neil. Really appreciate the introduction, and really, um, yeah, really pleased to be part of this uh, this uh, uh, panel today um, uh, as part of the Tips Conference. So, um, I'm going to talk about um, just a bit of the background about uh, you know where where the Empower program has come from and some of the foundations for this work um, stemming from our, our work in India. Um, first, just to kind of set the stage, I think we're all pretty well aware that mental disorders are a leading cause of disability worldwide. Certainly. Um, I'm sure this has come up in other other panels at at, uh, at this uh, at conference, um, but this is largely because um, worldwide very few people have access to effective treatments. Uh, we know that the uh, the treatment gap uh, globally is fairly is, is substantial, uh, particularly in low resource settings where the vast majority of individuals who live with mental illness uh, do not have access to adequate care. Now, this is not because it's really important to highlight that this is not because we don't know what to do. Uh, in fact, it's actually very much the opposite. We know that uh, there are effective ways to uh, both treat um, common mental disorders as well as support individuals with more severe mental disorders, um, but really it's a failure to implement this robust body of evidence uh, into real world settings where they can have the greatest impact for individuals who could benefit from these programs. Um, this implementation challenge really represents one of the most significant failures uh, in, in global mental health and really one of the key challenges that we need uh, to address in order to, uh, to, to address the global treatment gap. Um, and I'll 
emphasis of, of um, our work is really on psychosocial intervention. So really thinking of non-pharmacological ways to help support individuals living with a broad range of mental disorders. Um, in fact, the evidence base in support of these types of uh, interventions is incredibly strong. Uh, we know that um, there was a recent meta-analysis published in The Lancet demonstrating that uh, summarizing over 100 uh, randomized controlled trials from many low resource settings across the globe, effectively uh, essentially showing that these uh, treatments are effective across a wide range of cultures, a uh, wide range of uh, countries and languages and contexts. Um, and really, again, it's, it's just a, it's a, a challenge with how to get these treatments uh, into practice. So when we try to think of what are the implementation challenges, so why is it that we have had such a challenge getting these effective treatments um, in, into practice? Um, so when we think of what are some of the implementation barriers, when we draw from the implementation science literature, uh, of course, there's many other barriers. This is not an exhaustive list, but trying to distill this list into really three of the key barriers. So if you were, had to think about what are some of three of the key reasons why we cannot get psychosocial interventions uh, or psychological treatments into practice? The first being is the content. Um, so when we think of the content um, and where, where the origins of psychological treatments uh, stem from, uh, they're predominantly developed in academic settings uh, by predominantly white researchers uh, in high income countries. So in the United States or the UK is where uh, the bulk of this evidence uh, originates. Um, so these are complex treatment package, uh, packages. They're highly academic. Uh, they're not designed for delivery by regular people. They're not designed for use in just regular community settings. Uh, and they certainly were not designed for uh, use in different languages, uh, for different cultural groups um, and different contexts. So really, uh, one of the key barriers has been how do you break down this content uh, into what are the core pieces that we know, like the core ingredients that we know are essential for uh, achieving the you know, clinical outcomes, that, the desired clinical outcomes. Uh, but then how do we adapt these uh, to different contexts? Uh, so much of the pioneering research led by uh, key researchers in global mental health, such as Vikram Patel and others, uh, really demonstrating that these treatments, when adapted to different contexts and cultures and languages, uh, are highly effective. This, can be, this has been demonstrated in evidence, um, as I mentioned, from that summary of over 100 randomized controlled trials. Uh, but essentially, um, this has been demonstrated in, in uh, low resource settings in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, uh, and also in South America. The next real challenge is the supply. So now that the content, let's say you've adapted the content for different settings, who's going to actually deliver it? And who are you going to train and support to deliver it? Um, so really identifying who the individuals are who can be trained uh, to achieve the skills and competencies needed in order to effectively deliver these interventions. Um, so that's another real, you know, one of the key barriers that we seek to, to overcome. Uh, and the third is one that's often overlooked, and that's really the quality, um, you know, the, the focus on quality. Um, so even once you've trained, for example, lay health providers, community health workers, or other, you know, other just, you know, community members um, and how to deliver these interventions, how do you make sure that they're supported in such a way that they can de deliver them with high fidelity and high quality? Um, and the quality assurance is not only ensuring fidelity of the treatment delivery, it's also ensuring that the individuals who, who are delivering the interventions are supported themselves. Um, and that's really emphasizing that the delivery of mental health care is actually quite challenging. You're working with individuals who are in, uh, in, in distress, you're working in challenging contexts, um, and it often can be uh, you know, a, a type of task that is difficult to do uh, without adequate support to prevent things like burnout uh, or, uh, or attrition. So there's a really incredible opportunity now uh, when we think of you know, global recognition of mental health being a, you know, a, a major public health uh, challenge uh, and one that uh, needs to, uh, you know, it requires immediate action. Um, this very robust body of evidence showing the effectiveness of psychosocial interventions for a wide range of mental disorders, um, evidence showing that task sharing is effective, so essentially training uh, non-specialists or uh, other, uh, you know, lay persons to deliver these interventions. Uh, and then also now the advent of technology, increasing access of technology, partly driven by the pandemic, but also uh, growing access in the last, uh, in the last few years, uh, essentially has given us new opportunities to not only uh, support the scale up training programs, but also the ongoing quality assurance, which I will uh, speak to in the coming slides. Um, so I want to highlight some of um, our team's work in uh, central India. So this has been, an, a, you know, an ongoing. Uh, so, so essentially, this has been collaboration with Sangha. Uh, it's a, a world-leading NGO um, started in Goa about 25 years ago, 
Uh, and then they started a hub in Bhopal, uh, in, in the center of India, in the state called Madhya Pradesh, uh, just about 10 years ago. Um, so the bulk of my work is, is based in Bhopal in collaboration with our colleagues there. And um, what makes Bhopal interesting uh, and somewhat, you know, a challenge for thinking of how to overcome barriers to delivering mental health care, uh, it's in a low risk, a, a, a part of India that is uh, largely rural and uh, much less developed than many of the other states. So it ranks much lower on the human development index. It's much less industri industrialized. Um, so there's many more challenges in thinking about how to deliver care. It's also got a very large population, but it's widely dispersed. So it's a, even though it's a large population, over 75 million people, there's no large urban centers. So the population is uh, mostly distributed through small villages um, across a very, very large geographic area. So all of these make, you know, bring together a number of challenges when thinking about how do we overcome some of these distance challenges, um, thinking about uh, how to overcome issues related to poverty uh, and, uh, and other factors within the low resource context. It's also a very diverse state uh, in the sense there's many different ethnic groups, uh, many indigenous groups within the state. So uh, this also creates additional challenges when thinking about how do you scale up um, effective treatment of mental disorders across this type of terrain. So um, I'd like to introduce a program called Essence. This is a National Institute of Mental Health funded uh, program. Uh, it's called a scale-up hub, so it's one of 10 of these um, uh, hubs across the globe, um, all focused on addressing issues and scaling up uh, mental health care in low-resource settings. Um, looking at this challenge from a number of different uh, angles, uh, our focus is really thinking about how to build workforce capacity uh, to address uh, gaps in access to depression care uh, in rural uh, primary care clinics in, in Madhya Pradesh. Um, so our work started, this is now started about four years ago, um, just over four years ago, um, and began with a pretty extensive um, focus on formative research. So uh, our collaboration begins with uh, work with the, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, so the government of India uh, and the state of Madhya Pradesh. Um, and they really identified uh, a, a, this group of community health workers called ASHA workers, so accredited social health activists, as being the key group to um, to support in gaining the skills needed uh, to deliver care for depression. And part of this is aligns with national efforts to implement, uh, it, well, to work towards uh, universal health coverage uh, and the expansion of non-communicable disease care. So their NCD care uh, programming across the state and across the country. Uh, and depression being one of the core uh, conditions that would be captured within these, these new services. So even though this is, uh, there was a government mandate to, to make this happen, we began with uh, formative research in the uh, consisting of focus groups and interviews with community health workers from a number of different villages to really understand their perspectives around, well, here we are now trying to figure out a way to train this enormous cohort of community health workers. So just to highlight the ASHA workers represent the largest single uh, workforce um, of community health workers on the globe. Uh, there's over a million of them across India um, and they cover almost uh, nearly every state in the country. So we wanted to start by you know, finding out more from them about, well, if we're gonna train you to, to deliver care for depression, uh, is, is this something of interest? And actually, this is something that I think was one of the most striking findings early on in this project, uh, is that there was high recognition among the community health workers of the burden of depression within their villages. Um, almost all of them had expressed um, seeing these types of challenges before uh, in, in the form of uh, suicides within their villages uh, and feeling really helpless, not, not knowing what they could do. They felt like they weren't sure how to respond to these concerns. Uh, and it was really something that they found quite distressing, um, but were really open and eager to learn about ways that they could address these types of challenges in their communities. Um, so we started with um, first, you know, a number of design workshops and, you know, really trying to uh, learn from them, well, is there interest then if we were going to use technology to support training, uh, would there be interest in doing this? Um, and then just to kind of highlight what they, what we were actually going to train them to deliver, this is called the Healthy Activity Program. It's based on uh, behavioral activation, which is a uh, proven treatment for depression. 
Um, it's a brief treatment that can be uh, you know, easily delivered in about six to eight sessions. Uh, and essentially it's, it's a manualized program. So uh, it had originally been tested in a trial called uh, the premium program that uh, Vikram Patel had led several years ago, um, but it was a, you know, still a manualized program. So taking these kind of academic manuals uh, and then having to break these down, not only for this different context uh, in India, so in, in, this, in this area of rural India, but also thinking about how to digitize it. So it was actually two, two sort of challenges in one, trying to take this content, the manuals, turn it into a easily accessible mobile app that could be uh, you know, accessed within this, in the region, but then also making it interesting and engaging, but also ensuring that it would achieve the goals of the, of the program uh, and that the health workers who complete the training would gain the skills needed to deliver the treatment effectively. Um, so really thinking about how to digitize the content, uh, we went through a number of different iterations, a number of different prototypes. We developed animations and all kinds of other prototypes that uh, didn't work out so well. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. It was incredibly important to engage community health workers throughout this entire process. Uh, we tried animations, thought that might work well, but uh, it turns out that virtually anyone on the globe, if you have access to YouTube on a mobile device, uh, then you've probably seen Pixar. And if you don't have a Pixar budget to do to animation, it's not really something worth pursuing. Well, it can be difficult. So our animations weren't very good and they told us that. Uh, so we had to think of other ways to get the content onto uh, a digital device and to make it interesting. Um, we also found out from the health workers, they were very interested in the idea of using technology. They were very excited about using technology. Um, not, yes, because the devices were, I think, of interest, but also because then they could avoid going to these very cumbersome, you know, in-person trainings. Um, and there was a pretty well, uh, you know, there was a consensus among nearly all of the community health workers that they did not want to participate in sort of these residential trainings. They love the idea of being able to access the training on a device at, at their own leisure. Um, and partly because the residential trainings, which is how they're um, typically done in India, are usually in a central facility, a government-run facility that's quite far from their homes. Uh, it takes them away from their family uh, and other responsibilities. There's huge travel distance to attend these facilities. The facility, you know, the facilities aren't usually all that nice, so it's not something that they really, you know, it's not something all that appealing to to participate in training in these facilities. Whereas being able to access it on a device at their own homes, uh, or they often travel great distances by bus um, to the different villages for, for their um, work responsibilities. They felt they could actually learn uh, the content while uh, riding on the bus as well. So thinking about, I won't go into too much detail because I know Anushka is gonna talk more about the content development, but essentially drawing from the design literature, uh, both the education design literature, but also um, mobile health design literature, uh, really thinking about how to take the core content, the manualized content, break it down into the key components, uh, and then design a digital training that would be reviewed by experts uh, to ensure fidelity to the original model. Um, and then while ensuring also usability for the target audience, uh, usability and acceptability for the target audience, which also consisted of um, continuous iterations and then pilot testing. Uh, we opted for an app uh, Moodle platform. Uh, it was partly because it was easily accessible uh, in the setting where we were working, uh, but also because the content can be accessed without requiring a continuous wireless connection. This was one of our key findings in our early formative research and pilot testing uh, is that the variable bandwidth created a tremendous number of challenges with actually accessing the content. Uh, so this was really one of the key considerations early on. We designed video-based content. So this is Azaz, one of our uh, intervention uh, leads uh, in, in Sangath, and he essentially uh, was also, in, you know, an actor in some of the videos. So there was some videos like this, lecture videos, uh, but also a lot of uh, role plays. So much of it was designed around role plays, demonstrating the actual use of skills in clinical settings, showing how you would actually do this, uh, treating mock, you know, mock patients. Um, this was all done with actors um, and filmed in a variety of locations. So this is actually just filmed in the office in Bhopal, but we also filmed it in local clinics uh, and then other settings. And part of this was actually from the feedback from the ASHA workers. They liked the idea of actually having content that they could relate to, that looked familiar, that looked like settings that they, uh, they were familiar with. So once we were done designing this digital program, uh, we launched a large uh, randomized controlled trial to compare this digital program uh, with the gold standard uh, in-person sort of face-to-face -face training. Uh, but also we added a third arm to our trial. Um, and partly because, so the face-to-face the, the -face training, that's like your in-person, uh, you know, standard classroom-based instruction. 
the digital training is just the app with the, the program alone. Um, but then our third arm involved uh, coaching. And part of this comes from uh, looking at the literature and understanding that when someone is given a digital app, uh, the retention or the utilization rates are very low. People tend to stop after you know, a short period of time. Uh, but also from our pilot study, we found that uh, you know, there was hard to sustain engagement. Um, these are all volunteers in this program. So, you know, the idea of doing the training, they had to be pretty self-motivated. So we felt like the addition of a coach, um, someone from our team knowledgeable in the content, but who reached out to the participants on a weekly basis, really as a way to just offer motivation and encouragement uh, and to answer any kind of questions that they might have. But really it was designed really as someone to just kind of offer that additional motivation and support. So our findings from the trial, I think just to emphasize this was a non-inferiority trial. So essentially what we were trying to do is show that the digital training um, would not be any worse than the uh, in-person uh, gold standard training. Um, very good, uh, you know, one of the good things from our study is that we found that actually all three arms showed an improvement on a, uh, a measure of competency that our team designed. It was a, basically a multiple choice questionnaire um, that was specifically designed and validated for this trial. Um, and essentially it improved in all three arms, which I, was you know, a, a relief in many ways because it showed that the training had achieved at least one of its core objectives. Um, but I think it's also really important to highlight that the digital training with the coaching uh, and the face to, the in-person training um, performed better than the digital training alone. So I think that's just really you know, completely as expected. It's you know, what we had hypothesized, uh, but I think it also just confirms that a digital app while it can be helpful on its own in showing some improvement in knowledge, um, there with the added, you know, the added support from a coach or think of it as like an online course and you have a TA who just gives you that extra bit of uh, encouragement and support uh, can achieve even uh, better outcomes. Um, so just to highlight, you know, this thinking of where we are with this work is, it, you know, this started off initially with training. Uh, and then there's many more steps. So training is really only the first step in a health worker's journey to then delivering care and scaling up uh, mental health care. So this has now progressed into uh, an, uh, efforts focused on implementation. Um, so really engaging both the health system and then offering continuing support to the OSHA workers themselves. Um, so we have an ongoing implementa implementation trial right now focused on implementing this exact program and um, depression care within the primary care facilities. Um, and then also emphasis on moving from uh, initial training and achieving competency uh, to ongoing supervision and support. So really moving from first, how do you support learning to then supporting the ongoing delivery. Uh, and this has really been the key focus over the last couple of years now, now that we've trained community health workers, um, how do we then support them uh, with ongoing supervision and support in a way that is scalable. So this is a project that's been in collaboration with, uh, with Damagi. So it's a project that uh, Dr. Daisy Singla at the University of Toronto is leading. That's funded by Grand Challenges Canada. It's the PEERS program uh, and in close collaboration with Damagi uh, and then also uh, uh, Sangath in India. But essentially taking a measurement-based peer supervision process. This is uh, an evidence-based approach to support supervision and delivery of psychosocial treatments um, has been tested uh, in settings in India, but also in North America, um, uh, in Canada and the US, showing that this is a, a, an approach that can support the effective delivery of a psychosocial intervention delivered by a non-specialist health worker. The challenge is that the way that the supervision was initially done in the early uh, evaluation, it was entirely done uh, in person. So kind of thinking of groups of health workers coming together, discussing complicated cases, uh, and then reviewing and rating each other's performance. Um, so what we wanted to try to achieve is how do we digitize this entire approach um, and develop an app? Um, so this was adapting the ComCare app, uh, Damagi's ComCare app, to allow this process to function uh, completely remotely, uh, taking into consideration these challenges, the geography, low bandwidth, uh, and offering this additional support for the community health workers. So essentially they would deliver care, rate their own sessions, rate the sessions of their peers, uh, and then meet on a uh, bi-weekly basis to review performance uh, and to offer support, and then also to review challenging cases. Um, and this involves initial support from a expert supervisor. So this is someone from our team who is a, a clinician who joins these initial calls um, with the plan to gradually reduce the uh, number of times that the experts involved uh, so that this can function almost on a sustainable basis uh, entirely as a um, ongoing remote supervision. 
So this is really, again, fits into sort of this uh, larger, um, uh, you know, the larger vision for how to support community health workers uh, and other non-specialists or other lay, lay, uh, lay providers uh, in effectively delivering care uh, across uh, different settings. So beginning with this, you know, new learner, someone who has no prior, ex uh, you know, exposure to how to treat mental disorders. Uh, in this case, it was depression, really starting with this individual, helping them gain the skills and competencies needed offering the ongoing supervision and support so that they can become a competent uh, and skilled provider. Uh, and then such that they become, you know, an expert provider with the skills needed to then support the next cohort of community health workers. Uh, and this is really a the fundamental vision for the program, uh, the Empower program, uh, which my uh, fellow panelists will uh, describe in greater detail uh, in the next uh, in the next presentations. So I just want to acknowledge um, just the you know enormous team that has made this possible. This is a team spanning uh, many parts of India, largely our team in Bhopal, uh, also uh, here in the United States, many collaborators at different institutions uh, at Harvard and uh, and elsewhere, uh, and then also other collaborators uh, in other parts of the globe. Um, and then also just really want to highlight the a uh, number of uh, really key funders, uh, the National Institute of Mental Health being our, our pr primary funder, but really um, all, none of this work would be possible without, uh, without the support from, from these different uh, funding agencies. I um, want to thank everyone for your attention and I'll turn it back to you, Neil. Um, happy to leave my slides here or, or remove these to... Uh, yeah, after a minute or so you can, you can sure. put Anushka. Um, uh, gear up, but um, yeah, no, thanks a lot, John. I've, we've been working together for a long time, but I still learned a lot from hearing that that complete overview. Um, and for those of you who weren't here at the beginning, we're allowing a little bit of Q and A between the talks, so feel free to queue up a question for John. Um, I'll start off by asking one, which is, what are the the ASHAs, the community health workers, sort of instructed or trained to do when they encounter someone with uh, complex uh, mental health conditions or severe depression beyond what 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 they've learned in just a short time would be appropriate for? No, it's a great question. So um, part of the reason working with the ASHAs, so these community health workers, is that they are embedded within the health system. So they're a direct link to, um, so they are part of the formal health system, um, but they work primarily in community settings, each serving a uh, population of you know, about 5,000 people or about 1,000, I believe, to 5,000. Um, but essentially, they um, are often the first point of referral. So if they encounter someone in their villages who they don't have the skills or the knowledge to, uh, to, support, to support them, if then they have, then they know to refer. So actually, that's actually been one of our other um, efforts is really uh, a, a parallel project to this one. It was really training ASHA workers in identification of more severe mental disorders. So things like even schizophrenia or other psychotic spectrum disorders, really how to support early identification of these challenges in their communities so that they could then um, refer them to a medical officer at uh, a community health center or a larger, a larger facility. There's also district hospitals that they can refer to, um, but the ASHA is often the first point of contact. Uh, for mo most patients in rural India, this is the first maybe the only, but often the first person that someone will have contact with. Um, and really by ensuring that the ASHAs have the skills to uh, understand how to treat depression, even to how to identify it, um, also the skills to know when they aren't able to address that concern and then what to do next. So that's really been a key part of the training as well. Um, and then how to link patients with other resources that may be available uh, in their communities. Oh, terrific. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. No, thanks, Neil. Um, and I'll throw out one more question, which is, could you elaborate a little on the that competency, the competency test that you gave to test the digital training? I understand it like was sufficient for the purpose to show non-inferiority, um, but does it, you know, how well is it even possible to like, you know, give a give a test like that that can tell whether people are, are ready for uh, to provide this treatment? Yeah, so the test that we designed, um, so it was informed by prior work from our collaborators uh, at the University of Oxford, uh, so Chris Fairburn and then also um, Zafra Cooper, uh, and they had done a similar work for, um, for work in the UK actually, designing a, a scalable um, approach for measuring clin clinician competency uh, for delivery of a psychosocial intervention. And uh, essentially the concern is that to assess competency is actually in itself a bottleneck or a, ba a barrier to scale because it's pretty time intensive, um, and we had to figure out a way to 
um, assess skills in, in an, using an approach that could be highly scalable, but then also could be standardized because we were conducting a, a randomized controlled trial and needed to make sure the same assessments were used across all three arms. Um, and that, just to highlight, we used paper-based assessments because some of the participants were getting technology, others weren't, uh, and we wanted to make sure that there wasn't any kind of uh, added advantage by having the digital training, then you suddenly are more familiar with the digital tool, you may do better on a digital assessment. Um, so the measure, the huge advantages with this measure, and we're, we're also using it uh, for our work in the United States, um, but is, is that it's highly scalable, um, it's standardized, uh, it's been validated for assessing skills, it shows that it can differentiate between individuals who have this knowledge or skills and then those who don't. But then the key caveat is that it really is only a multiple choice test. Um, like anything in life, there's usually some kind of standardized test that comes afterwards. Uh, just because you do a standardized test doesn't mean you actually uh, know what to do in, in a real world setting. You still need to practice those skills. The only way uh, to achieve competency is through is by doing. Um, and we know that for virtually anything, whether it's driving, whether it's uh, you know, practicing medicine, you probably have to do it uh, in order to, to gain the skills and competencies to do it effectively. So this is really only the first step. Um, it's kind of, it's part of a, you know, a significant pathway moving. Even our work right now with the ASHAs, um, they've done this test, but then they've also gone on and had uh, more support and they've delivered care to test cases with close observation and supervision from our team uh, to sort of help them graduate uh, into a uh, becoming independent providers where they can deliver care without this sort of uh, ongoing, well, direct supervision, but just with the ongoing super, peer supervision that I, I spoke to. So um, it's it's got pros and cons, this kind of measure, um, but it is it is limited if you're trying to see that if someone do this test, then suddenly you know that they are going to have the skills to go and deliver care right away. It's not doesn't quite work that way. But yeah, thanks, yeah. Neil. No, no, no. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for thanks for explaining it to us. I'm not seeing any questions in the Q and A on the on the Zoom, um, which fits. We're we're kind of uh, uh, ready in terms of the schedule to move move on to Anishka. Um, so Great. over over to you. Uh, and thanks a lot for that, John. All right. Well, hi. It's really nice to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and the opportunity to present on this panel. The title of my talk is Behind the Scenes, Uncovering the Process of Digitizing Psychological Interventions and how it is we, we kind of do that from conception all the way to delivery. So just as a quick agenda, you know, what I'll plan to talk about today is I'll talk about what Empower actually is, how we create um, content for this platform on, on our little content development team. And I'll go into the video creation as well as the learning management system. And then we'll have a little bit of time to actually demonstrate and empower video for you all, which I'm very excited to see, um, you know, what your thoughts, reactions, questions might be um, after that. And just to cue you as to where you are in my talk, there's a ribbon at the bottom of the screen. And every time we switch sections, you're going to, you know, see the red kind of change and move along the way. So that's just to orient you to where you are in the talk. Now, John has, you know, really talked thoroughly about the scope and scale of the problem, as well as the opportunities, you know, that he and his team have seen with regard to conducting some formative work that led to the vision for Empower. So the vision of Empower is to really democratize access to psychological care. And the way in which this vision is manifested through Empower is by building capacity across the healthcare sector using a suite of digital tools that allow someone to um, learn, master, and deliver evidence-based psychological treatments within a healthcare system. So essentially, it's an online training platform, and it's a very, very exciting, um, you know, application of digital technology because it allows anyone within a healthcare system, whether they might be interested in psychology or they may have no background in psychology or mental health, to really be able to learn, master, and deliver these treatments. So to start off, I want to kind of discuss this point or question of, well, can anything be on Empower? Or, you know, how is it that we select what actually goes on to Empower as a platform? And so there's certain key criteria and rules that are followed when it goes into the selection process. So psychological intervention has to be evidence-based, which is defined as having been tested in at least two or more randomized controlled trials. And these trials must be in routine care or community settings to enhance the ecological validity of, you know, are these treatments really going to work in a messy real world setting? Next, the treatments must um, be 
must be proven to be um, delivered effectively by non-specialist providers. And they must have at least a moderate and hopefully stronger than that clinical effect on patient-centered outcomes. The treatment must be open access and non-proprietary. So there must be um, a manual associated with the treatment and this manual needs to be open source for it to be something considered for Empower. And finally, the selection of treatment packages is always approved by Empower Science Council, which comprises of leading treatment experts. Now you might be wondering who are these experts? Well, the Science Council members are essentially comprised of world-renowned public health experts, epidemiologists, clinical scientists, and you know you might recognize some of these names like Dr. Vikram Patel, Sona, you know Dimijan, David Clark, and of course we're very grateful to have John Maslin with us as well on this call today. So I'm going to dive now into our process, and just to give you a very quick snapshot of what content creation is like on the Empower platform, I'll talk about this process of blueprinting, which is a very big picture idea of how it is we think about and want our content to look. And then after blueprinting the content and finalizing that, we go into the actual nitty gritty details of developing the course by drafting videos and textual knowledge and content that supports it. And finally, I'll discuss how we pull it together and integrate it into a learning management system. Now, essentially blueprinting has to do with developing the course syllabus. And I'm gonna kind of define um, the blueprint in this way. There are two blueprints. The first one is the course blueprint. And the course blueprint is really like a content valid syllabus. So it's like a table of contents for the entire course. So to give you an example, if I'm um, designing a course on foundational skills, then the course blueprint is going to contain a whole set of modules on, well, what are the most important parts of foundational counseling skills? And how can we make sure that this course blueprint, including all the different modules, is really capturing all the different dimensions of what goes into being an important or, or all the important skills that go into being a foundational counselor. So the course blueprint is content valid syllabus. And then the competency blueprint is really just the twin image of that. But this blueprint specifies the skills, knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors that we hope to inculcate as part of the teachings in the course blueprint. So just to give you an example of what this looks like, every course is going to be organized into modules, and each module has different lessons associated with it. So in foundational skills, maybe the first module might be understanding mental health and well-being, and then lessons might contain um, you know, these, uh, these concepts like, well, what is mental health? How do we define normal? What's abnormal? Um, is mental health on a spectrum? What does it look like? How do we recognize common mental disorders? What is the meaning of an evidence-based treatment? And so the corresponding competencies that we want a learner to you know, get from all of these lessons is that they're viewing mental health on a spectrum. They understand some of the basic screening tools for depression, and they understand what an evidence-based treatment is, how it's defined, how it's conceptualized, and why it's important to provide evidence-based care to folks. So moving forward into the actual course content, right? So we've, we've talked big picture, we're gonna kind of deep dive now more into the details. Essentially our process for course content development, um, it's a very multi-step process and it takes a lot of work. So I'm gonna try and break down each of the parts of it. But essentially it starts with drafting scripts and then um, we, we write in pairs. So you know one person drafts the script and then another person will peer review the script and then give it back to the main writer. The main writer will um, incorporate the edits and then give it to expert review panel. And then the expert review panel will obviously have a huge set of edits as well. And then finally, the original writer of the script will integrate everyone's feedback as a kind of redactor and then finalize the script. So each given course in Empower has a set of these videos that go through this very kind of arduous process of peer review, feedback, expert review. And all these videos are also supported by textual explanations that support the videos, applied learning by way of like multiple choice questions, true and false, you know, knowledge checks, and then loads of supplemental materials for your kind of A++ students who want to learn extra and get a deeper dive into it. And we try and make, you know, this information really fun for them. All right. Now you might be wondering about the experts in this section of, you know, how we're, how we're um, drafting the content. So the original writers and peer reviewers are myself and my colleague Sheena Wood, and then the expert reviewers are just kind of household names when it comes to, you know, incredible um, foundational counseling skills and behavioral activation, which are the two courses I'll focus on. So Sona Dimijan, Donna Baptiste, and Tara Mehta. And I do want to highlight that the role of these reviewers in Empower is all fostered through a connection with the American 
psychological association. So we're definitely not creating any content, you know, um, written by psychologists without psychologists, you know, know how any expertise and um, say in the process. So now when it comes to the actual video production, so say we have a set of 35 scripts all set and ready to go for a given course, then we send them to a video production house. And this is actually um, a really nice photograph that makes me sentimental because it was the um, first ever Harvard Empower video that was shot. And we had contracted a production house in England actually to shoot these videos. And so they sent us pictures on a little WhatsApp group the first day that they were shooting. And uh, videos tend to be five to eight minutes in length and they tend to be in two styles. So the first style is more of a didactic video. So say you're teaching someone who is um, a community health worker with you know, 12th grade education, and they may not know very much about the concept of how to diagnose depression or recognize symptoms of depression. Then a didactic video sort of explains, well, what is depression? It might contain you know, social aspects, biological aspects, behavioral aspects. How do these all work together in tandem? What are the signs and symptoms of depression? And so this would be talked about as a didactic video with just two counselors kind of chatting back and forth and looking at the camera and we try to make it engaging. But the more engaging and fun video is the demonstrative one, which is actually a role play between a client and a counselor. So in the same scenario, if you're teaching about depression symptoms, a role play video might look like I as a counselor, I'm explaining to John who will pretend his depression. And I'm kind of explaining to John like, oh, it makes sense that you have low mood. You've been through a lot of life stresses lately. Like how's your appetite? How's your sleep? So I'm actually running through a checklist of depression symptoms with him in a more colloquial conversational and less of an academic style. And then when it comes to actually shooting the videos, you know, I just want to emphasize that this was such a learning curve for me. It was like a whole new world. So, you know, as a kind of clinical psychologist uh, and, and an educator and an avid writer, the rest of the project was, you know, within my wheelhouse, like, I'm like, all right, it's creative writing about psychology. I can do this. This is exciting. But then when it came to like finishing the whole bunch of scripts, right, and, and taking it to a production house, it was so interesting. And there was so much to learn because as soon as we started working with these production houses, we had to really be involved in key decisions regarding well, what locations do we want to shoot at and what should the cast look like? And so, you know, we're sort of watching videos of these LA actors and trying to figure out, you know, who's really going to make a good counselor personality. Um, and then we also had to curate a lot of clinical props because of course um, this is, you know, a very specialized kind of world. And so we wouldn't expect a production house to have a homework worksheet for depression treatment or anything like that. So there was a lot more that went into this particular process because the devil is in the details. And so I just want to emphasize some lessons learned here that, um, it really is worthwhile to contract and sign on to production houses that care. We, at least um, during the time that I was doing content development for Empower, worked with two production houses. And both of them were absolutely passionate about this project. They cared so much about this, um, you know, this broader notion of making sure we can, we can skill up people in delivering psychological therapies. And they were very, very dedicated and passionate, which I think makes a very big difference to your working relationship and, and you know, just how much kind of extra and above and beyond the production house is willing to go. That being said, the first production house was in England. And I think there were just some you know, glitches when it came to time differences, when it came to casting options, because England was not ethnically diverse in the same way that the US context is. And so it would be a little bit hard when we were trying to cast for Latinx folks and things like that. So a note on uh, trying to choose production houses in a similar same culture, similar time zone. Um, and then finally, just, you know, choosing production houses where their um, sense of coordination, communication aligns pretty well with your teams as well, because our team is very detail oriented and on it and you know, into scheduling. And so I think all of those things can make a really big difference for a smooth working relationship and to create the best quality product with multiple iterations and revisions. Now, following the, you know, the process of developing the videos, which also go through their own process of peer review and feedback three or four times, so those get finalized. And then what we end up doing is we work on all the textual content that supports every single lesson. So this is just like literally what you would click through as part of slides on an online training, as well as supplemental content. With supplemental material, I want to highlight that this really should not be academic. So we don't want this to be dry, boring, theoretical, the kind of stuff that we have dedicated our lives to reading as academics. Instead, we want it to be interesting, readable, fun, and this can include um, YouTube videos, podcast sections, news articles, and then also clinical resources. 
So for example, in the depression course, you know, we might have um, behavioral activation has a very big component of tracking your behaviors to see, well, when are you in a better mood and what are you doing when you're, you know, kind of in a lower mood. And so we'll actually create clinical resources that help someone, you know, track their behaviors across the day and across time and we'll make it really user friendly. So they really have a sense of, oh, wow, like if I gave this to a patient, this is what it looks like. This is how I would explain it. So we really want to make the process very tangible and concrete for them, but also fun and like super easy. And so there's a lot of work that goes into um, creating these supplemental resources and texting content. Now, when we kind of integrate, right, and put all of this together, um, this is a sneak peek into Cornerstone. And Cornerstone is one example of an authoring tool that allows us to, you know, like click through and go through the entire course. So you'll see over here, you know, one in five adults in the U.S. experiences a mental illness in a given year. So this is just part of giving some good psychoeducation about rates of mental illness and normalizing, you know, how, how prevalent this is. And then we'll have the knowledge check questions right underneath. We'll have thumbnails for the videos. And then anytime you complete a lesson, there's a very satisfying kind of green check mark, <laughs> lesson complete. So this is an example of that particular authoring tool. And then another authoring tool is called Articulate. And we've actually moved towards this um, tool lately. And this is really nice because more than clicking sideways, like what you're doing over here is you're really scrolling vertically. And so this, this particular authoring tool, I think everyone has found very easy to use and they like it quite a lot. So it just sort of depends on what your purposes are. But the main point of authoring tools is that they need to be user-friendly. They should be adaptable to like seeing it on a desktop or on an iPad or a phone, because as John was mentioning, like there are folks that are using these sorts of courses um, as part of commute time, et cetera. So that's just an important piece to keep in mind that it needs to be user-friendly. Okay, now I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let the video speak for themselves. I'm really excited for you guys to see this video and it is a three minute video. So bear with me and someone send me a message if you can't hear sound. Now that we've discussed what we mean by depression, let's clear up some widespread myths about this problem. Some people think that depression is a sign of weakness or laziness, but the truth is that depression is a serious mental health problem. It's valid and real in the same ways that physical health problems like diabetes are valid and real. Looking weak or tired is a symptom of depression rather than a reflection of someone's character. It's also important to note and share with clients that Depression can happen to anyone. It is common and it exists in every country, across all ages, and with every gender. Some people believe that mental illness is caused by spirits or can be cured by religious rituals. While it is important to be respectful of cultural traditions, it's an opportunity to also share with clients what we know through science. Depression is a mood disorder that can be managed and cured by both medicine and counseling. Exactly. Sharing accurate information respectfully is important so clients can make informed choices about engaging in their treatment. However, ultimately, it is the client's choice whether or not treatment will be counseling or through another form. Some clients may become irritable or very negative when depressed. This doesn't mean that they are a negative or pessimistic person. So it's important to avoid making global assumptions. Precisely. It's also a good reminder to be a keen observer of depression. For example, irritation in that context is actually a symptom of depression. So it is clear evidence that the person is struggling with a mood disorder, and therefore they're not inherently being themselves. While depression is often related to difficulties in daily life, it is caused by a combination of biological, psychological, and social factors. A person experiencing depression has an imbalance of chemicals in the brain. And we know that our physical health can impact our mental health and vice versa. Psychological factors contributing to depression can include things like low self-esteem, feelings of self-blame and hopelessness. Finally, our social world can significantly influence our mental health. For instance, if we experience trauma in our lives or if we don't have strong social support. As part of our job as counselors, it's important to correct any myths people have about depression while still respecting their views and personal experience. Since depression can look and feel different for every individual, it's important to be curious and interested in our client's experience. This knowledge will help our clients feel better and enable us to help clients reach their goals. 
All right. Thank you for watching. <laughs> So just really quick, as part of next steps, you know, we are rolling out our digital curriculum throughout a pretty major healthcare system in Texas. And my colleague, Natalie Carmio, will be covering some more information around that. But it's going to be very exciting to see how people are responding to this particular form of training and um, what efficacy it might have on, on client outcomes. I'm personally very interested in that question as well. So I just want to thank you all so much for your kind attention today. Um, this work really takes a village. And of course, I've mentioned many, many people throughout the course of the presentation. However, I would be remiss if I did not mention Sarah Taha, Margot Mara, and Natalie Carmio, who did a lot of the heavy lifting to help integrate all of this information into our learning, learning management system. And I'd be very happy to answer any more questions that you might have. So please do feel free to email me or drop questions in the chat right now. Thank you for your time. Well, thanks so much uh, for that, Anushka. And we have time for one question, uh, which fortunately we have exactly one question in the Q&A widget, uh, which I'll read to you, which is the question is, this is tremendous work. Curious if it includes modules or content on education of caregivers or families. More broadly, how is a caregiver or family support, how is caregiver or family support incorporated into the model? Thanks for that question. That's a really good question. Thank you so much for asking that. So as part of our foundational counseling skills, and, and I should have probably mentioned this, but essentially everyone has to do that particular course before then they get streamlined into. So you want to learn about autism treatment or depression or trauma and PTSD. So everyone gets this building block base of foundational skills. And so we actually think that incorporation of a significant other or a social support person is a core foundational counseling skill. And so for that reason, it's included in this particular foundational course. And um, your point is a very good one that you know, it would be good to have some information regarding how to educate family members, et cetera. We don't currently have that specific piece in our course, but that actually is something that I'm gonna think about and write to the team about. What we do talk about is how the patient themselves can be empowered to make decisions about whether they want a social support to be part of the treatment process or not. So we educate, um, you know, the provider about how do you have that discussion with the client? Like, how do you use Socratic dialogue to get them thinking about this? And how do you um, weigh the pros and cons with them so they really can make an informed decision? And then also when it goes sideways, how do you sort of you know, get out of the situation where you have a social support as part of treatment because you know, therapy is supposed to be a safe space for everyone, obviously. And so that's really more the angle we've approached it with, but thank you so much for your nuanced point. And I'm definitely gonna write to the team about that. I appreciate it. Great, thanks for that. And Natalie, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll pick it up from where Anushka left it. Um, let me, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, as Anushka mentioned, our current uh, deployment of the VA curriculum includes foundational skills as a pre-course or prerequisite and then behavioral activation. Foundational skills introduces the learner to basic foundational mental health concepts and provide uh, essential skills. Uh, and some of the topics covered, as Anushka mentioned, what's mental health, confidentiality, risk assessment, supervision, and self-care. Behavioral activation is a brief psychosocial intervention uh, to address adults with depression. Um, and one, the main topics are understanding depression, problem solving, behavioral activation, linking, function, activity, and mood, the P how to use the PHQ-9 PHQ measure, um, so, as Anushka mentioned, we deploy the formative research in Texas. Um, the, the main objective or aim was to iteratively assess our content. And for that, we partner with Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute and Baylor Scott and White Health Team. We recruited uh, both, of, both of our partners help us in the recruitment, and we also recruited specialist providers from the Harvard Ambassador Board. And the, uh, the main goal of having both specialists and non-specialist providers was to have a variety of feedback to, to test usability, effectiveness, and feasibility of the, of the training. When conducting the formative research, uh, we also included not only the trainings, but also post-training uh, demographic survey, satisfaction survey, and online focus group discussions. The demographic survey um, was basically, uh, we collected information about background, current occupation, and previous experience with behavioral activation, we, because we wanted to understand and be able to differentiate both specialists and non-specialist providers. 
the satisfaction survey where it was a uh, measure we developed for, with 15 statements um, asking about course content, structure, navigation, and, and other, other features of the training. And then finally, we conducted online focus group discussions uh, where we use um, a guide uh, that we develop in relation to technical challenges, user friendliness, level of engagement, and interactive content. Uh, in terms of demographics, a brief summary, 22 participants took both foundational skills and behavior activation, and eight of them were specialist providers. They were mostly female, and 40% uh, of them were uh, under 45 years old. Um, in terms of race, um, they were a majority of white people. And in terms of ethnicity, we managed to recruit 20% of Hispanic or Latino uh, providers. This is uh, something that we care a lot of because, first of all, Texas has a lot of diversity. And we also want to try to decrease uh, inequality for minorities. So we wanted to have uh, specialists and non-specialist providers that have an Hispanic heritage, so they can also help us inform our trainings. Uh, in terms of the satisfaction survey, there are a lot of data. Uh, generally speaking, overall, non-specialist providers uh, were more satisfied than specialist providers and, and, and had higher scores. 70% uh, of specialist providers say that the course was easy to follow and it was an effective learning tool. And over 90% of non-specialist providers, they enjoy the training. They mentioned that the course uh, used familiar language and expressions, which is something that also Anushka sp spoke about, that it was an effective learning tool, that the questions helped solidify the, the content, and they were able to gain a comprehensive understanding of the modules. In relation to the focus group discussions, uh, the overall review was on foundational skills was that the, con the content moved fluidly, was easy to engage. Um, participants really enjoy the role plays as they provide an excellent and realistic interaction between clients and counselors. They also enjoy the formatting of the course uh, with the multiple choice questions and the slides uh, that summarize content uh, in the end. And also they mentioned that models uh, help clinicians to provide holistic care, which is, was something very uh, that we were very glad to hear. And they said that they appreciate the non-judgmental aspects of the lessons and the videos. And in terms of the navigation and style, it was easy to use, intuitive. Uh, most of our participants use laptops uh, because they have work laptops and they have no major technical issues with that. Um, and in relation to the focus groups on behavioral activation, uh, they appreciate that we that the BA course um, linked uh, how to conduct behavioral activation, linking it with patients' values, the car matching activities, session checklists, and the tables with overview. They also appreciate uh, the COVID nineteen related content, uh, as we have a special lesson or. A special lesson on that and, and a role play that to address COVID related stress. Uh, and also, uh, once again, they appreciate the role plays um, and the summaries. The, since we changed, uh, as Anushka mentioned, from, from Cornerstone Create to Articulate as, a, as the tool to create our courses, uh, BA uh, was. Um, more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, it was broken into more digestible face uh, uh, parts and summaries. And also include the ability, the articulate uh, has the ability to change the video speed and include closed captioning, which was something that uh, participants appreciate. In terms of general recommendations and the actions we took, um, as I mentioned, uh, during the focus groups on foundational skills, people mentioned that they wanted more interactive and engaging features that may have made, uh, to address that, we changed from uh, Cornerstone Create to Articulate. We continue to use Cornerstone as a learning management system. So we create our content on Articulate, like 
uh, put together the videos, the written content, the supplemental material, um, and then we uh, export that from Articulate and re-import it into Cornerstone, and that's the learning management system, uh, but it allows us to have uh, many other features. Uh, participants also mentioned that they would like an overview of all the content, so we created a roadmap uh, that is in the beginning of the, of the course and also in the beginning of each module, uh, explaining what to expect on each lesson, what are the learning objectives, how long it will take for uh, each lesson and each module to be completed. Um, also, we reformatted the knowledge checks. Uh, we not only include multiple choice questions as Anushka showed, but also matching, true, false, free response questions and, 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 other, and other more interactive features. Um, in relation to the supplemental material, um, we changed that to be in the end of each, each module. So it was like bef before we had it as a separate module itself, like supplemental material was its own module, but now we embedded that into each module. That's something that also articulates allow us to do so we can embed uh, the YouTube videos or the content we created, the worksheets, etc. And also participants mentioned that it will be useful for them to have all the major content uh, put together so they can access it and don't have to scroll through the course each time when they are uh, actually implementing BA. So we are creating the foundational skills and behavior activation manuals. Uh, these are going to be also embedded in the courses. They can be printed or used online. Uh, so for instance, the worksheets can be, if you are having a Zoom session, you can use the worksheet and complete it online, or you can print it if you are going to someone's houses and use it in the moment. Uh, so we included all the worksheets, and it's also a tangible guide to reference in the field, when in the field you can have the manual if you want uh, to level check uh, what to, what should be done on each of the sessions. Uh, we concluded the formative uh, risk testing part and we move on into the pilot study, uh, which is actually what we are working on right now. And it's like the last step to actually scaling up uh, in a very, in a, in a much bigger way. Uh, our study is a mixed methods pilot study aimed to assess the feasibility, acceptability and preliminary effectiveness of the digital training program. Um, we are partnering with Baylor Scott and White. They are doing the recruitment. Participants must be uh, adults and employed in, in Baylor Scott and White. And our sample target is among between 50 and 70 uh, participants. Um, for this, uh, for the pilot study, there are um, many more steps than for the formative research. We do the well consent. And we do a pre-knowledge assessment, which is the multiple choice uh, test that uh, John mentioned before. Then we give them between six to eight weeks to complete both trainings. Uh, after that, they move to a post-knowledge assessment, which is the same as the pre-knowledge, but we want to compare um, how people are doing after taking the courses and also the satisfaction survey I mentioned for the formative research. Then we are also including the competency assessments. Competency assessments, as John mentioned, uh, Empower is not only about like training uh, and course, digital course um, training, but it's also uh, about quality assurance and making sure that people are able to deliver treatment with fidelity to the original manuals. Um, so competency assessments are very, uh, are a standardized role plays, uh, which is the traditional goal standard when training clinicians. So we include that. We are basing those uh, in relation to the equipped platform from the WHO. And then uh, participants will move into the, the MAGI peer supervision platform protocol, uh, which also John showed how it was used in India. And we are adapting now that for the US context. And after all those uh, those steps are finished, we're going to conduct focus groups, uh, is hopefully in person in Texas. Um, and well, this is the timeline and we're currently uh, people, some, some of the participants already completed both courses, but most of them are still working on that. This is the updated console diagram. We invited 99 participants, uh, Baylor Scott and White inviting 99 participants. 53 uh, mentioned that they were interested in, in working, in taking the courses. Um, 
44 completed the pre-knowledge assessment, uh, already 17 completed foundational skills and 16 are in progress. And for BA, uh, I think five already completed BA and 15 are in progress. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm over time. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I think it's Neil, right? Uh, well, we have three great questions in the Q and A, so we can okay. go through those. One, the last ones for everybody, and I think we can get through them all before my talk if we give uh, uh, not too long answers. Um, so the first question uh, for you, Natalie, is how is the training adapted to tailor to cultural context? Context, for example, somatization is a common presentation of depression among people in India. Yeah, I think we we can we can all talk about that. Uh, but like my main point will be, we always call develop all the curriculum and content with experts in the field, both uh, the target audience and clinicians that are, are delivering already are are already delivering care in uh, in the in the sites. Uh, so that allow us to tailor and to make sure that all our content is culturally appropriate. Um, and also then we have uh, communities reviews, so that will also uh, help us ensure that our content is uh, adequate. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to add there that um, essentially Empower is not culture agnostic. Like there was a lot of work that was done for at least Empower USA to be very culturally attuned to the US context. So there also is Empower India, and the idea would be to really kind of make it um, culturally and contextually appropriate for the given place where it's being rolled up. But that being said, one thing that we did do was we have like a module on cultural considerations, and the emphasis is less on cramming content about a specific culture, but it's more about like how can we think about cultural considerations flexibly? So how can we embody an attitude of cultural humility? What are the um, ways, what is the stance that you should take in order to ask the right questions to understand how cultural factors impact someone's identity and mental illness and their experience of it. So it's more about the critical thinking that underlies cultural considerations that we're focusing on, as opposed to like, here's everything you need to know about a Spanish speaking group of people. Like that's not the approach that we take. Yeah. Yeah, and also for the Spanish version, um, we are we are we are currently uh, creating the Spanish version of all the courses, the, uh, the both courses for uh, Texas. And as I mentioned, it's not a translation; like the, all the scripts are going to be adapted uh, with the collaboration of both clinical experts and community uh, community workers. So, in that sense, it's not just translating one course to different cultures, but like trying to understand and incorporate differences to make uh, the, the tailor the courses as much as possible. Well, super, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and the next question, I'll throw it out to all of whoever wants to answer. Um, is there a mechanism in the program for ongoing supervision for participants once they begin work in the community? Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, we are in, in India, uh, the peer supervision is already working and uh, it's not only peer supervision, but also expert supervision in here in the States in Texas, we are going to incorporate the peer supervision platform that the Maggie is creating the prototype uh, to test it. And then when we roll out, we are going to include that. I think the main, the main idea is to have both to make sure that we that our uh, like trainees are able to deliver quality care but they also have uh they also have a system of support so they don't burn out and they they have all the all the help they need to actually be able to deliver care as delivering care in mental health is complex uh so we we provide peer supervision uh it's also digital so it's a it's a it's like the platform that john showed before uh, where trainees can uh, record the sessions and other peers other peers will review and rate those sessions using um, a scale that's called the QHAP scale. Um, and that those, those sessions will also be reviewed by experts uh, in that sense, like specialist providers in mental health. Uh, and the, I think the goal, and also in terms of thinking about sustainability in the long term and also scalability, is that uh, peer supervision 
participants that go through peer supervision and, and, and complete at diff uh, different settings of like requirements, at some point they can become specialized supervisors. So that also will allow us to grow uh, without taking, without having to like go to the top of the pyramid and, and ask all the time for a, a specialist mental health peer the supervision, yeah. Super, and I'll just uh, uh, thanks for the shout out to 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 Buggy's, uh, yes platform. Um, but I'll add that the you know there's I would say the major innovation was this idea of using peer supervision and mechanisms to make that work, and then we're just providing a technology platform to support that that previously developed um, uh, innovation. So we don't we don't own the the protocol or or, or uh, we're we're just helping to to scale it up and support it. Um, and. I will move on to the last question, another excellent one. Uh, it's, it's sent out to all of you. Um, have you found that the training of non-specialists has helped to address mental health stigma in the community, either here uh, in the US or in India? Yeah, I cannot speak about India. Um... And this, the thing is like in the US, we're still pilot testing. So we don't have a lot of uh, data on community or patient outcomes. For now, uh, literature shows that usually when you train community providers with mental health and normalize, as Anushka was mentioning, like what's depression, what are mental health challenges, if this is a spectrum, then uh, usually what it follows is that stigma is reduced because also mental community health workers are already working in the communities and they already know these families and they already know who to address. So I think in that sense, it's, uh, it's much easier and it doesn't have like the, the associated stigma of consulting a psychiatrist or having to go to a mental health clinic. Uh, but I will come back to you on that after we have more results on community and patient outcomes. Yeah, I'll just add, I'll add to that as well. I think it's, it's a great question about the stigma. Um, I think one of the kind of findings I mentioned that was, I think, uh, somewhat of a surprise, I think, certainly to our team, to myself included, was the openness and the interest to learn about depression among the community health workers themselves. Um, and I think that sort of contradicts or contrasts uh, some of the prior research around resistance or reluctance to learn about uh, mental health among health workers. And um, that has, I mean, we have we have not observed that in our work, even training facilities in India. Um, there's been, I think, tremendous buy-in from the health system. Um, there, I think there still remains, uh, I mean, stigma certainly exists in communities. It's, it's, it's still there. I think there's just been a transition in the health system, partly, uh, partly because of the adoption of, um, well, the integration of mental health care into, into health policy uh, in the country. So it's it's become sort of one of the core conditions. Uh, and then also just the glaring recognition of it being a, a serious concern in, in many communities. So I think that that is maybe one, one major shift. Um, I will highlight, though, that for more severe mental disorders, because um, I mentioned we have projects also focused on schizophrenia, spectrum disorders, and other, other severe mental illness. Um, it's very different, I think, in that in that type of uh, in those types of disorders. There there remains, I think, um, not only stigma, uh, but what we've learned actually is there's just a very very poor understanding um, that first of all that it's actually a a mental health problem that can be treated. Um, that's just I think that's been one of our striking findings in another project working with the same cohort of community health workers um, and training them in sort of early identification of schizophrenia was just. They, you know, they they were aware of these types of symptoms. They were familiar with, you know, seeing people with those types of problems in their communities, but they had no idea that it was actually a health condition that could be treated. It was sort of thought of as just something was wrong with them, or it was something related to, you know, spiritual uh, concerns, and then uh, just really sort of an overwhelming lack of knowledge. So that that does sort of tie into stigma um, in some ways. Um, and then the other issue too is around stigma among patients, and I think where. We don't have data yet at this point. So just to the work in India, the, the community health workers are now delivering care. Um, they, this has now um, been ongoing for the last couple of months. It's taken, it's been sort of a process to get them through uh, to that point. Um, and one thing that will be very interesting to look into is um, among patients, they may feel more comfortable receiving care from community health workers. I think that there's a huge opportunity to sort of break down stigma because they're trusted resources within their communities. Um, we know that stigma is a huge problem for seeking care at, uh, at the sort of the formal clinics. Uh, there's the district mental health program. We know that people don't want to be 
they don't even want to be referred there. They don't want to be seen walking in through the door. Um, it's just not a place really of, of you know, so it's, yes, there's gaps in access to mental health care, but there's also issues around concern of accessing the formal mental health services because people know what's in those buildings. Um, whereas the community health workers, they go to people's homes. That's very normal. That's very accepted. It's a, you know, that's something that's a, a you know, a regular activity in most communities. So if they come, uh, people don't know that they might be treating depression or maybe they're checking on, you know, uh, maternal and child health issues. So I think there could be opportunities there to really um, break down stigma, but then also offer, offer, uh, offer opportunities to, to seek help uh, for, among patients who may otherwise be reluctant due to stigma. So great question, though, about the stigma piece and really, a really important challenge in this work. Great. Thanks a lot. Um, and thank you for the other question in the Q&A about uh, Q &A about the digital technology. I'm going to use it as a segue into my talk. Um, there's some other questions there people might be able to like even type answers to uh, if they have a chance while I'm speaking. Um, but I'm going to jump in and sake of time. And this is going to be shifting gears a bit. I am uh, uh, not a mental health specialist like the other uh, panelists, um, but instead work for a basically a digital technology company called Demagi. Um, and I am going to try to bring you through this storyline in about 10, 12 minutes, um, which is uh, to describe uh, first our core product, CompCare. Uh, it's come up a few times uh, in this in its presentations. Uh, and just describe it. Doesn't It's not mental health specific, but it's this uh, pretty general purpose open source platform used to digitize frontline workers in lower and middle income countries. Then I'm going to describe our new product vision. We just got some some new funding and we're building out um, new elements of ComCare. Uh, we're calling it ComCare Connect and what we hope to get out of that. Then I'm going to describe how we've applied our core product uh, to mental health. You've already seen some of this, but uh, most notably through our partnership with Empower, we've been uh, applying our core uh, platform, which works for a lot of different um, health conditions for mental health. And then the real kind of point of this talk is to get to this last part and give a vision of how we think the new product, ComCare Connect, can also be used uh, to help scale up um, uh, mental health in some new ways. All right. So with that, let me go to the first part, which is to talk about ComCare. Um, and John already sort of described a little bit of the background by talking about the ASHA workers in India. Um, we work with like a wide range of frontline workers, uh, the many of them being community health workers across um, lower and middle income countries. We work the most in Sub-Saharan Africa and India. Uh, as some of you uh, may be familiar with, community health workers often play a, just a pivotal role in the health systems of lower and middle income countries. They're often the first um, and sometimes even the only uh, point of contact between the health system and some of the poorest populations. They work across all sorts of areas, HIV, TB, maternal and child health care. Um, they're also from the communities that they, they serve very often and often are facing a lot of the same struggles, don't have a huge amount of training or education, um, but are really playing a key role in a lot of the improvements we see in um, uh, global development outcomes across the world. And so we are, Damagi is, is part of an ongoing uh, growing effort, I'd say, to help professionalize uh, these community health worker and other frontline worker cadres, uh, including by digitizing them, uh, which is basically replacing their paper registers with a, a digital solutions often running on smartphones. Um, we have a pretty big evidence base, over 90 studies uh, that show the benefits and the value of equipping uh, community health workers with ComCare uh, mobile apps, including several randomized control trials that show improvement in um, important health behaviors of the clients of the community health workers equipped with uh, ComCare, including things like seeking institutional delivery. And there's been some nice cost-effectiveness analysis showing that it's on par with some vaccines to, to add the digital. Um, ComCare is not only a proven intervention, but it's one of it's a pretty small field of people working on this. But we're one of the not the most widely scaled platform. We've had consistent growth since we've launched in 2010 with this open source platform, and we have thousands of different programs working on it in over 100 countries. Um, there are some programs that have been running on it for 10 years, and over 100 that have been running on this our platform consistently for five years. And there's some nice evaluations that attest to the maturity and robustness of the platform. So that's our kind of core work, just a little bit of brief background. Uh, let me now talk about the new stuff we're trying to do. Um, and um, 
we are trying to, we're going to, we got funding from the Steel uh, Foundation for Hope, a uh, significant amount for, for the size of our organization. And with it, we're going to build out new, what we call vertical areas of comp care. Where it's, it's a lot of the same technology, but we're going to strengthen our ability so that through comp care, we can support digital learning, digi digitally supported delivery of services, digital uh, verification of those services, and then digital payment for those verified services. Um, historically, we really focused on that second one, deliver. So we're going to be expanding our capacities for digital training, digital verification, and digital payment. Um, this enables some new models of uh, deploying interventions. So the vision we have, I'll, I'll walk through an example of vitamin A, but you have a, let's say a community health worker who's got access to this ComCare Connect platform that we're building on top of ComCare. And this gives them the ability to learn different skills, uh, which they can then be paid to utilize. So on the on the ComCare Connect platform, they would have opportunities to learn different types of things, let's say a parenting intervention, mental health delivery, or maybe a simpler example is vitamin A delivery. So again, this is the kind of general platform. Uh, people could, uh, the community health worker can say, yeah, I'll learn how to deliver vitamin A to children. It's an important high impact intervention. Um, they learn how to screen children to see whether they're eligible for vitamin A, make sure they haven't had it too recently, don't have uh, conditions like vomiting or fever. Um, and then once they learn it, then they can also find opportunities through ComCare Connect to, to join campaigns to deliver it. So then they would join those campaigns, utilize their skills. The app that they would use during delivery would also repeat those same kind of decision support and checks to make sure they happen, support counseling to the uh, families. Then when those um, uh, delivery is verified through things like, let's say, GPS coordinates or such, uh, or simple outlier detection, if you're familiar with that, then people would be paid for the time they spent uh, delivering vitamin A during the campaign. So that's the that's the kind of dream of it. Um, we're starting pretty small. We're organizing pilots for something like vitamin A, including vitamin A deworming and malnutrition screens. Very small pilots, like 5,000 children each, uh, but working in four different countries, uh, probably the next three to six months uh, to get a sense of how this works. All right, so that's the new product, this old product, uh, core product, new vision, and now the, uh, let me briefly talk about how, just to sort of, uh, as backgrounds kind of revisit how we've been applying uh, for the last couple of years, our core product to mental health. We had a few projects here and there in mental health, but really two years ago, we realized it was important to prioritize it in the areas we worked. Um, there's this huge need. There wasn't a lot of the groups kind of like us, digital groups that were focusing on this compared to other areas like maternal and child health. Um, and so, uh, John did a nice job of already describing uh, this work, but the role that Damanki played was to build digital support for the interventions that Empower and partners like Sangath um, had developed. So first we built the kind of core, uh, we took our core product and built a case management system for that works offline for ASHAs to use to manage their um, cases. So you could like go take the PHQ-9 digitally on their phones, help track the history of each of their clients' PHQ-9 scores. Um, and then during the session, there wouldn't be very much, a little bit of before the session would remind them of important things. Um, during the session, it just records the session. Afterwards, it checks to make sure those important things were done. Um, but then in between sessions, they could then review their own ones. They could listen to their sessions on the digital platform and then give uh, rankings based on the uh, uh, QHAP score that was described before rate their own sessions, rate their peer session sessions, and then compare those ratings um, for discussion. Uh, we're building a bunch of other areas of, of digital support for mental health with a, with a few partners. Uh, just to give you one example, we're also building out basically a uh, digital version of the uh, mood tracker and other, um, other kind of uh, often paper-based uh, worksheets that are given to clients during these recycle social interventions. So the idea is in, in lots of places, uh, people get pretty you know, short, you know, sometimes even as short as one session or maybe uh, five or eight sessions, brief psychological interventions. And then the clients can use a, a chat bot or some other digital app that they can use on WhatsApp or Telegram to help them practice the techniques that they learn uh, during uh, those interventions. Nothing particularly new here compared to like the you know the thousands of other mental health apps that are deployed, but we're uh, repurposing it to really work for the these hard to reach populations uh, that aren't often addressed. But you know they're not English speaking, different literacy levels. Um, so we're building these apps for these contexts um, as well. 
All right, so now we get to the last part, which is how do we apply this new vision that we have um, to mental health? And I've just got two slides here. So first is just if we take learn and deliver, so just the ability to do digital training and uh, digital delivery on one platform. And we think this will open up a lot of opportunities. The first is kind of a convenience factor. You know, if any program using these tools could use one tool rather than two, that's a significant advantage for a lot of programs without a lot of um, resources. But maybe more importantly, you could expand the idea of training where it goes just beyond the kind of classroom training, just like you, you what it means to be trained is you get classroom training, um, but you're trained, you know, then you, you take that as a next step using the same tools, the same framework, you uh, then follow that through to practice um, of your first few clients, you know, under supervision. And before you're really considering your training is kind of like, you know, the diagrams that John showed, um, the digital platform is bringing you through that to get to some level of competency. And so when you think about offering digital training, it could, it doesn't have to end at the classroom. It could also like go through at least initial practice. Uh, and then four programs that wanted to play the whole thing, you know, at scale uh, uh, continuously, then you've got the seamless experience between training and service delivery, um, which has advantages over having to learn two systems for providers as well. And then in the last couple minutes, I'll, I'll briefly describe sort of the, the even kind of bigger payoff we imagine, which is a new model for replicating and scaling uh, uh, mental health in lower middle income countries. And so imagine that, and there's increased appetite, I think, for funding mental health intervention, but that there's governments or donors who are willing to pay, say, $100 per person who is successfully um, treated for uh, depression, or even just correctly treated for depression. And the problem is that even if you have people who are willing to pay that amount, um, it's and even if you have local groups that have the capacity to do it at that price, it, you know, it fits their models of how much it costs uh, them to deliver it. Um, it's hard to create the transaction between those the donors and the groups that are able to do it because maybe maybe large organizations, big international NGOs, could facilitate it. They have much higher overhead rates and they can't really do it for hundred dollars per person, um, even though the core intervention doesn't cost that much. And so our idea is to provide technology where. Smaller groups um, or, or larger groups can can take this full complete digital platform. It does the digital training, it supports service delivery, does verification and supervision, but also does all the accounting and compliance to ensure that to track which clients are actually done, uh, which which clients are actually given the depression treatment, and then that gives us the kind of reporting and accountability that allows the uh, that money to flow in um, to continue to. Uh, support the mental health care at that price. So I realized I went through that a little bit quick, but uh, we have just another couple minutes. So I am going to open it up for questions and discussions to me or any of the panelists. Um, and I will just go through. So thanks very much for the, uh, uh, that um, nice, um, gratitude for sharing our work. I, I really, it's been great to be part of this panel myself. Uh, and I will go to the second question and read it live, which is somewhat tangential question, but as a Hindi speaker, I enjoy the name Damagi. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Um, and yes, Damagi actually is, it was formed, founded by uh, doctors practicing in the United States, but from uh, uh, India or operating and uh, being in the United States uh, uh, primarily and focused on Sub-Saharan Africa, but it is the Hindi word for brain damag or like brainy person or others might know better, but kind of like, I think of it as kind of nerd. Uh, so that's where Damagi came. Um, and then over to the panel for the last question and then we'll close out. I'm curious what the vision plan is for sustaining this work in terms of funding or support, support beyond the current grants. And if I have to pick someone, I don't know, John, do you want to say a word? Uh, about that? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Yeah, and, and, and thanks, Ipsit. That's a yeah, great question. Um, and it's one where, well, it, it, you know, the work in India, the goal is to have that adopted by the health system. I think that's really the only option for long-term sustainability. And part of the reason to do the research now is that they want to see that this works, the approach works. And then, but until there's actual commitment to fund this um, at the health system level, I, I think the long-term sustainability will be very difficult because grants are short-term, they've got other you know, terms attached to them as well. So I, I see that being an incredible challenge. I think if for the United States, there may be other opportunities as well. I mean, I think it really is gonna, it's a similar, it's actually a similar situation with the health system we're working with in Texas. The 
have sort of said the same thing. Well, let's see if it works. Train that, you know, train this cohort of health workers, and then we'll sort of figure out how we might address billing and so forth afterwards. So I think they there definitely has to be um, some, you know, evidence to show that the training is effective, that it works, and that, that the care is effective. Um, but I think ultimately it's going to rely on either health systems and funding this work um, if there's a billing model that will work, um, and then also you know uh, the actual you know the ministries of health in other countries uh, funding this in, in systems where where they're the payers, um, because yeah grants would not be sustainable long term. I would say that's that's most definitely true. Great, and with that I will. Uh, uh close almost on time and fulfill my last obligation as a uh, moderator, which is to encourage you to go back to the agenda and the conference and see the other sessions. There's still uh, at least one more um, uh, going on for the afternoon. So there's more, more to see at this conference. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all so much. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everybody.